and they came from something else all the way back to pond scum which made itself from chemicals from etc <clears throat> and uh, let's again reiterate that we're viewing the world through biblical glasses and what does the Bible tell us about the origin of living things? Uh, first of all, we would hold in Genesis chapter 1 in reference to fruit trees. God said he created fruit trees, produce fruit with seed in them after their kind. And uh, this is a pretty simple concept and everybody's aware of it that plants reproduce after their kind. You plant tomato seeds, you get tomato plants. You don't get bean plants. And ten, ten times in Genesis chapter 1 it says there that God created things after their kind. And cats produce cats and dogs produce dogs. And when someone goes to hospital to have a baby, you don't, get, don't come home with a chimpanzee. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> but see, the evolutionary idea is that, in fact, that breaks down. Somewhere along the line, many millions of times, something has given birth to something which is not its own kind and has become something else. But the biology we're aware of today, which we all are, is that things reproduce after their kind. That's observational science. It's a story that one thing has changed into the other. In fact, ten times it says in Genesis chapter 1, God made things after their kind. But the evolutionary idea is that things do not reproduce after their kind. The Bible is here talking about biology, isn't it? Biology. Now, the evolutionary idea is that we go back to pond scum and they've got this nice tree. In fact, the old tree is getting a bit rattled these days because it doesn't really match up with the molecular biology real, real well and they're starting to pr propose that there were even perhaps several different origins of life. And uh, even getting the, the branches of the trees crisscrossing one another and all sorts of stuff's going on to try and explain the hard data. But basically they're still proposing that everything made itself and everything descended, everything we see today descended from some common ancestor or common ancestors in the past which made themselves from the chemicals in the sea or whatever at the time. And so this view uh, from modern day evolutionary biology uh, contradicts what the Bible's biology says. And in this view, of course, all mammals had a common ancestor where mammals... Uh, we warm-blooded hair and suckle young and give birth to live and so on. Uh, so are elephants and mice. Mice and elephants are classified as mammals and they had a common ancestor in the past according to this evolutionary idea. So if you trace the ancestors of elephants and the ancestors of mice back far enough, you would find an animal which gave rise to both of them. This is the evolutionary doctrine which is taught in our schools and universities and on nature documentaries on television as a fact today. Now, if that was the case, and the rocks buried under our, the fossils buried under our feet were the history of life on Earth, then we would expect to find some fossils which actually record this process of one thing evolving, or these things evolving from their common ancestor. But in fact, we don't find such fossils. Dr. Colin Patterson at the British Museum of Natural History in London is an expert in the fossils and he wrote a book about evolution. But in the book there are no examples of transitional fossils, something becoming something else, a reptile becoming a bird or an ape becoming a human or anything like that. And he was asked about this, about why he didn't have any illustrations of these transitional fossils. Dr. Patterson said, I fully agree with your comments on the lack of direct illustration of evolutionary transi transitions in my book. If I knew of any fossil or living, I would certainly have included them. He goes on to say, I will lay it on the line, there is not one such fossil for which one can make a watertight argument. Now there's a scientist who is being candid about the evidence. Unfortunately, that candour is uncommon today. Uh, the evolutionary doctrine is so much a part of the philosophy of most people in academic institutions that it's taught in a doctrinaire manner without any admission that anything could be wrong with it. And so uh, students get the impression they must accept this. But if you, in fact, are doing senior biology at university, like do third year or fourth year, paleontology... Uh, you will get exposed to textbooks which actually reveal the truth. But by then, most students are sufficiently indoctrinated in the idea 
They don't question it. The sort of thing I'm talking about is this is a diagram showing the ancestry of a whole range of uh, organisms. And I hope you can see it there, but there's a lot of dotted lines. See, there are solid lines and there are dotted lines. The dotted lines actually show you the connections back to the uh, common ancestors, supposedly. Now, why are the lines dotted? Because there is no evidence for the connection. It's imagination. And you can find the upper level fossil paleontology textbooks actually show that the evidence is not there. But not in first year biology uh, at university. And it's not just biology either. Uh, it comes into other subject areas, this sort of teaching. Well, what about the human ancestors? And I don't have time to go into this. I have a, a DVD over there, a whole hour on this, and that doesn't do justice to the issue. But let me show you what goes on, the storytelling that goes on, and it illustrates what goes on with this whole, whole field. Artipithecus Ramatus Kadaba was proclaimed as our ancestor and great exciting find as the oldest connection between us and the apes. Well, what was that connection with the apes based upon? I mean, you might say, well, what about those bones, is it, that makes them think that that's our ancestor? Well, you see, chimpanzees have curved toe bones for grasping onto branches, but our toe bones are straight for walking on feet upright. Well, this toe bone here, see, there's actually toe bone right up there, see, with a circle around it. That toe bone is slightly less curved than today's chimpanzee toe bones, supposedly. So therefore, obviously, it's becoming a human. That's it. That's the evidence. You say, well, what about all those other bones? In fact, there's only one toe bone there. It's drawn from three different directions and photographed from three different directions. What about all the other bones there? Well, there's drawings and photographs of different bones. There's uh, four other lots of material. Well, the toe bone was actually found 18 kilometres from the other four lots of material in a different layer in the ground. It gets worse. In fact, the other four lots of material were found over an arc 15 kilometres long in four different locations. And they put all this stuff together, and that's our ancestor. And this is published in Nature, the world's top science journal. If I published something like that in real science, I'd be laughed out of court. But this is the flimsy nature of the evidence for human evolution is such that they publish this nonsense. So like This must have been the first suicide bomber spread over the countryside. And I could show you many, many more examples like that. But it's like one evolutionist actually said, everybody knows fossils are fickle, bones will sing any song you want to hear. Remember what Taz was saying? It's not the evidence that speaks about evolution, but it's the philosophy that drives it, which interprets the evidence to suggest evolution. And of course, as a Christian, as believes the Bible, as God's word, God was there in the beginning, he created things like he's actually inspired it to be written, and then I take a different view of the evidence. And guess what? The evidence actually, I believe, fits much better with what the Bible says about these things. In fact, when you look at the fossils, you find many of the things we see today are actually present in the fossil record, uh, according to their own dating systems, even hundreds of millions of years old, basically unchanged. This is called, these are called living fossils, things which we find in the fossil record which are still around today. Coelacanth is one of these, a famous one, because uh, it was thought to have been extinct with the dinosaurs 65 million years ago, and it was found living off the coast of Africa in 1938. And there are, there are ones going back hundreds of millions of years, insects and things and worms and so on, which to all intents and purposes are exactly the same as what we have today, but unchanged. In fact, there's another one here found recently in Australia, Wollamai Pine, and that's the actual paleontologist said it was like finding a living dinosaur because it actually dates back 150 million years to the Jurassic era, uh, when, which is the thick of the dinosaur period, supposedly, and found living happily today. Uh, uh, no indication of any change. Now, what the fossil record fact in sho shows is stasis or things staying the same and extinction. There is extinction. There are animals that no longer exist that were in the fossil record. 
but we basically see things staying the same, which is what? Things reproducing after their kind, just like the Bible talks about. Well, we now today understand why things cannot change one thing into the other uh, by natural processes. And of course, it's to do with the incredible amount of information in living things. And that information is stored in DNA. And you've all heard of DNA, of course. It's the National Dyslexic Association. <laughs> DNA, human DNA was decoded uh, recently and a great achievement of modern science to decode the human DNA. But DNA is an absolutely phenomenal information storage system. In fact, to illustrate how incredibly efficient DNA is as an information storage system, if we took just two Aspro-type tablets sized of DNA, and we if that was DNA, two tablets of DNA, you could store information in that DNA equivalent to over, over the distance to the moon in CDs stacked up. Or if you want to make it books, 157 times the distance to the sun would be the stack of books you could fit in those two tablets of DNA. It's an information storage system. And with this decoding of the information in living things, it's become incredibly unbelievable that living things could have made themselves or that they could change one thing to the other by natural processes. The problem is even the simplest living thing has an incredibly complex coded DNA. Even the simplest bacterium has equivalent of one book of 500 pages and that might sound easy, you read a book of 500 pages, but in fact thousands of scientists around the world are working feverishly right now trying to understand how this one book of information all works together. Oh, they understand bits of it and, and a fairly good comprehensive picture of how it sort of works overall, but the details are mind-boggling, how everything all integrates together and how it all works. In fact, it's beyond the capacity of one human being to actually understand more than a tiny fraction in detail of the living organism called a bacterium. Even the simplest bacterium is incredibly complex and it can reproduce itself. But that bacterium not only has it supposedly made itself by an accident from chemicals which made themselves from the Big Bang and all that, but that living thing, say one book of information, has changed itself into all the living things on Earth. If you're going to change a single-celled organism into a horse, you have to add information to make uh, hair and nose and eyes and uh, hooves and bones and heart and liver and all the things that a horse has that a single-celled organism does not have. In fact, we have the equivalent of a thousand books of information on our DNA. You're a walking library. In fact, you have more... Consider every cell in your body has that thousand books. You have more books in you than all the books on Earth. The amount of information in you and, you and me is just incredible. Uh, how do we get from one book to a thousand books of information by natural processes? Well, the evolutionist tells us it's by, by mutations. What are they? Well, they're copying mistakes. When you go from uh, one book, to, uh, one, 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 sorry, when you get, go from one generation to the next, the information is passed on. You got your information from your parents, they got it from their parents, and from, all the way back to the first parents, Adam and Eve. But the, our first parents, according to an evolutionary story, is something like pond scum. So this evolutionary story says that the information has increased from the simplest organism, which is not simple, through to a human being. How did that happen? Mutations did it. Mutations are copying mistakes. When the information is copied from your parents to you, a copying mistake changed a letter or two or three here and there on the DNA. That's a mutation. It's like a copying mistake when you're typing on a word processor, you hit the wrong key, that's a copying mistake or a mutation. That's why you need to spell check it, spell check and find all the errors you had when you type things. You see, random changes, which are what they are, destroy information. Only intelligence creates information. If you take a random approach to writing something, you don't get information out of it, you get a mess. And so you would expect mutations, random changes in complex coded information to actually mess up the information, destroy it. That's what we find. 
we find that mutations are known by the destruction they cause. We have over a thousand human diseases that are known to be caused by mutations. That's a whole website devoted to it, if you want to go and have a look, at, look it up. There's like over 10,000 mutations that have been identified that cause human disease. And many of us are carrying those mutations. Some are worse than others. Things like cystic fibrosis, for example, is an example. Uh, Haemophilia is another example. Here's an example of a mutant, a TNR mutant. That stands for totally naked rooster. A TNR mutant has a mutation in the information for making feathers, which results in it not being able to make feathers. Is the rooster improved? It may be. Mutations are sometimes helpful. I'll give you an example of that in a few minutes. But uh, mutation, this mutation re removed the information, removed the feathers from the rooster. The rooster it might be improved from the point of view of the, of, the, of the poultry farmer because he doesn't have to pluck it. But from the point of view of the rooster, he's going to freeze in winter, certainly on a day like today, and fry in summer. Not much of an improvement for the rooster. So if someone found a mutation which actually put feathers onto reptiles, that's what you need to change them into birds. One of the things you need to do to change a reptile into a bird is put feathers on them. If someone found a mutation which put feathers on reptiles, I'd be very impressed. But you don't find mutations like that. You find mutations that remove feathers from birds, but you don't find them that put feathers on reptiles. Because you wouldn't expect that to happen because mutations actually are random changes, destroy information. One of the experts in this, Dr. Lee Spetner at Johns Hopkins University, studied this biological information, and he said not even one mutation has been observed that adds a little information to the genome. Now, of course, it's just possible by chance that some a few, a handful of these mutations might be found that add a tiny little bit of information. I mean, just by chance, somewhere it must happen uh, along the line. But if this was a process by which a thousand books of information in a human being was generated from one book in a bacterium, we must be able to find plenty of these things, examples, but you can't find them. In fact, why do people believe in this? Well, it's like this. For a dinosaur to evolve into a bird, there would have to be an increase in genetic information. The dinosaur would need new information added to its DNA to grow feathers. Yes, and science has never observed such an increase of information, but we do observe the loss of information. Then why do so many people still believe in evolution? That's just another case of loss of information. Basically, if you will not believe there is a creator, then you have to believe in some form of evolution or everything made itself without a creator. Well, you visit natural, museum, uh, natural history museums, so-called, like in London, and you find there, they say, follow the footsteps of Charles Darwin's theory of natural selection. Understand more of Darwin's argument by observing the display of dogs resulting from this process. What process are they talking about? Processes of mutation, natural selection. We'll talk about natural selection in a couple of minutes. Well, here's a couple of dogs, a Chihuahua and a Great Dane. Now, my wife's a vet. She assures me that Chihuahuas and Great Danes can be mated artificially. But folks, what do we have here? We have dogs. We have extreme variety of dogs, but they are still dogs. They've been bred in the last couple of thousand years by people from a wolf ancestor. Wolves, dogs, uh, today are still, still interbreed. Well, you can get all sorts of dogs. Some, some of the changes by mutation, for example, you can take a dog with normal length legs and a mutation in the information of making legs results in a dog with short legs, and we call it a dachshund. And some people think they're corgis or something, and people think they're wonderful. But it's a loss of information that results in this, these sorts of processes. You can get pushed up faces, you can get long ears and floppy ears and twisted ears and funny... You get all sorts of funny things, naked dogs, but they are still dogs. In fact, it's things dogs do change into different dogs. They are still dogs. It is not evolution in action in spite of the bravado of the claim at the museum. Well, of course, people then think on television, on, on uh, documentaries and things, and all the time you hear that antibiotic resistance is, is evolution in action. We must teach our children to understand evolution, otherwise we won't be able to fight the diseases that are causing people to die. Heard that sort of stuff? And, of course, this is the bravado used uh, by the secularists to try and 
push the creation view behind the scenes. But if you have a look at this, you find that, in fact, evolution is not involved, not, not increase in information is not involved in this antibiotic resistance. Take, for example, uh, Helicobacter pylori, which causes um, uh, gastric ulcer. And an Australian actually showed that, in spite of a lot of uh, resistance to the idea. And uh, he showed that a bacterium caused it. And it wasn't antacids and all that sort of stuff don't do much good. You've got to get rid of the bacterium to cure the thing. And people have antibiotics today to cure it. And you get rid of these uh, ulcers. Well, let's redraw uh, Helicobacter pylori to make it look a bit funnier. And talk about how this happens. Well, what, the normal antibiotic is absorbed through the cell wall of the organism and it has an enzyme which changes the antibiotic, antibiotic into the poison. And so the antibiotic in the normal uh, bacterium uh, produces this enzyme which converts the antibi antibiotic into a poison and it kills it. However, some of these bacteria had a mutation which inactivated the enzyme. So what happens now, we've got a mutant with his inactivated enzyme and the antibiotic still absorbed through the cell wall and taken inside, but this fellow doesn't have the enzyme that can convert into the poison. So it's now resistant. But you notice what's happened. We've got a loss of information, a loss of functionality, which actually caused the antibiotic resistance. Now, every case of antibiotic resistance has been studied at a molecular level has been this sort of change. Either if it's due to mutation, it's due to loss of information, or more often than not, it's actually information acquired from other bacteria that already have it through a thing called plasmid. They swap those little loops of, back, loops of DNA around. So, in fact, evolution has nothing whatever to do with understanding, properly understanding antibiotic resistance or insecticide resistance or any of that sort of stuff at all. In fact, what about natural selection? What happens there? We again see natural selection is actually involves a loss of information also. Take, for example, these couple of wolves here, very friendly-looking wolves. Now, these two, uh, these represent the two genes or a pair of genes. Uh, one gene says make short hair. The other gene says make long hair. Now, in this case, um, those of you who are biologists, we, these are co-dominant, not, not, not dominant and recessive, but co-dominant genes. So in other words, there's a mix, mixing effect. So if you've got a short gene, short hair gene, a long hair gene together, you get medium length hair. Okay? So when we mate these together, because of the uh, rearrangement of the genes that occurs during reproduction, sperm and an egg gets one gene of each. So you can get a sperm with uh, a short hair gene and an egg with a short hair gene. And you get an offspring with two short hair genes. You get short hair wolf offspring. And you get the other varieties by the same process. You get a medium length hair or a long haired wolf in the offspring. This is a rearrangement of genetic material, existing genetic material, which causes variety in the offspring. But the genetic information was already there. What happened in the 1850s and so on with Darwin is that they saw this variety in the offspring and assumed that information was actually being generated naturally but it was already there. Mendel, a creationist, actually showed that about the same time, but his work was buried for about 40 years uh, until it finally surfaced. So the information was already there. Now, OK, after the flood, there's an ice age, and uh, with the ice age, of course, you're getting a variety of wolves being bred off the ark from the ones that came off the ark, short hair, medium length hair, long hair wolves, and so we have them here in the ice age, uh, ones living at high latitude, of course, the ones with long hair are better adapted to cold conditions, right? So what happens is the others get killed off, natural selection in operation, and then the ones that then breed are the long-haired ones, and they can only have, because they've only got the long-haired gene, they can only have long-haired long offspring, and you've got a now a variety of wolf which is adapted to cold conditions. But in the process, you've lost the gene for short hair. You can't go back to the short hair wolf. You've lost it. So natural selection actually gets rid of information also. So if mutations destroy it, natural selection destroys it. The two processes which actually are supposed to make evolution work actually stop any increase in information. You've got an impossible process. In fact, you get variation in living things. 
Uh, you get variation in people, dogs and frogs and horses and things, but you don't get any evidence that one thing could change into the other or evidence from biology that they could change into something basically different. In fact, one of the evolutionists actually said this. Uh, George Gable Miklos, that's a good name, uh, said this. So we can go on examining natural selection at all levels as well as hypothesising about speciation events in bedbugs, bears and brachiopods until the planet reaches oblivion, but we still only end up with bedbugs, brachiopods and bears. None of these body plants will plant transform into rotivers, roundworms or rhynchoseals. You might say whatever rhynchoseals are. Well, people say, but, but how come there's similarities in living things? Look at chimpanzees and humans, there's so many similarities. Well... Have a look at this. There's two cars. There are many similarities between these two. The original V-Dub Beetle and the original Porsche, other than the fact they're both yellow, for those who aren't interested in cars. But, um, but they're German, and they're both designed by Dr. Porsche, the same designer. And so they have many similarities under the bonnet in their design. They won't bore you all with the details. At high school, you would have been all shown these diagrams in school textbooks in middle high school, uh, showing these similarities between embryos of human, pig, fish and so on and how embry human embryos have gill slits at a certain stage and are supposed to go through a, a fish stage and all this sort of stuff. Do you know that, that is fraudulent? And it was known to be fraudulent well over 100 years ago. In fact, uh, here are actual photographs of these embryos which look nothing like the drawings. School textbooks still have these drawings today and still espousing the fraudulent claim that we basically go through a fish stage or that we're even similar to fish at a certain stage during our development. But there are similarities between living things. School textbooks will show, and university textbooks will show the similarity between limb structures, between a human and a frog, for example. We have five fingers, five toes, and two bones here, and, and one bone here, and so on. And so there you go. That's because we had a common ancestor with frogs. Well... There might be another reason why we have similarities in living things. And by the way, look at the horse leg. It looks nothing like ours, and yet horses are supposed to be much more, much more related to us than frogs are. So then you have a different story which says, oh, well, you see, horses have adapted a different way of walking. It's a storytelling exercise. It's actually not uh, rigorous science at all. But perhaps God created things with similarities so that we would know there is only one creator God so that we are without excuse. That's what it says in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. How would God create things in such a way that we could see there's only one creator? There's similarities in all the living things, which just like the two cars, showed that there's the same designer behind them all. In fact, I believe God has put um, similarities and differences there which actually thwart the evolutionary explanation. For example, you can look at the frog and human foot development and find that they, in fact, develop quite differently. Uh, the, uh, the frog foot develops by uh, outgrowth of buds to form the toes, whereas a human foot or hand actually develops as a sort of a plate and the material between the toes or fingers dissolves. So quite a different developmental process arises at the same pattern, a good way of thwarting evolutionary explanations because if they actually ended up with the same patterns because of evolutionary ancestry, it should be by the same process. They all arrive at the same pattern, but it's a different process. You also find patterns in living things that cannot be due to any evolutionary ancestry. For example, the similar body forms of an extinct reptile called an ichthyosaur, we think is extinct, uh, sharks and killer whales, uh, dolphins and so on, very similar body forms. Uh, why? Not through any evolutionary ancestry, but because I believe they were designed similarly uh, by the same creator. In fact, the evolutionary story is they have talk about convergent evolution. So what's that? That's when things look similar, but it's not due to evolutionary ancestry. <laughs> uh, again, storytelling. Well, what about um, the... Uh, this was asked a while ago about the reducing atmosphere on the Earth. Well, what's the significance of that? Well, again, in the school textbooks and university textbooks, there are diagrams like this sort of thing that shows how, well, the building blocks of life, or even some of them claim life itself, could have formed by this process on the Earth in the beginning. And so we have this uh, gases, uh, which are fed through some sparks, and then we get some amino acids. 
And this is proclaimed as being how life could have possibly formed or at least the building blocks of life could have formed in the beginning. Now, the problem with this is that you notice the gases there, uh, which are, are methane, hydrogen and ammonia, there's something missing. Uh, the missing bit uh, is the oxygen. In fact, the experiment had the wrong inputs. There's no way in the world the, the, the atmosphere of Earth could ever have been uh, devoid of oxygen. Why? Because if you take water vapour in the atmosphere and take uh, UV rays from the sun, it dissociates the water to produce oxygen. And in fact, if you had no oxygen in the atmosphere, you'd have no ozone. If you had no ozone, any life on Earth would have been killed by cosmic rays anyway. So you've got to catch 22. So they've got the wrong inputs. And what they don't tell you in, the, in this little uh, story in the textbooks is they have the wrong inputs, and they don't also tell you they've got the wrong outputs. So not only have you got the wrong inputs, but you've got the wrong outputs, wrong products. Because they did get some amino acids, but to get life to form, you need amino acids which are pure. There's actually two forms of amino acids, left and right-handed forms. And uh, life is actually built on left-handed forms. And uh, they're called left and right-handed because they're a mirror image of one another. So just like your hands, your right hand won't fit in a left-hand glove, a right-handed amino acid won't fit in an enzyme designed for a left-handed amino acid. It won't fit into a protein because it'll actually mess it up. And so these processes actually give 50% of each and you actually stop life in its tracks. It won't work. And there's many other problems with this story as well, but they don't tell you that because they want you to believe that life could have formed itself because this doesn't get over the problem of the information in the most simplest living thing is actually incredible anyway. Well, it's a bit like this. Here's a chap in the lab desperately trying to work out how life could have formed itself in the beginning without a creator. And he's got all this knowledge that he's developed, uh, acquired about the uh, living things and the simplest living thing and how, how it works. And he thinks this. Uh, if I can just uh, synthesise life here, uh, I'll have proven that no intelligence was necessary to form it in the beginning. Uh, not very logical, is it? Because if anybody ever did synthesise life in a test tube, and it may well happen one day, it won't demonstrate that it ha could happen without intelligence, which is what evolution claims, but it will demonstrate incredible intelligence necessary to form life in the beginning, and in fact, create all the different living things we see on the earth today, the different kinds of living things. Enjoyed that? Thank you. Um, suppose you were um, getting on an airplane at the Huntsville Airport, flying to Washington, D.C., let's say, and the uh, gate agent said, oh, good news, we've got a brand new airplane waiting for you at the gate. Uh, it's only got 90% of the parts, but it's ready to go. Would you get in that airplane? <laughs> Chances are it wouldn't work very well unless it had all the parts. Well, living things contain many organs and systems that consist of multiple parts. And if some of those parts were not there, the organism does not benefit from that organ or system. And natural selection would not favor the survival unless all the parts are functioning. So evolutionary processes don't allow organisms to retain unused parts because they would actually be a drag on the system. Fewer of them would survive um, in the hope that one day the rest of the organ system would show up. And there's a few examples. One common one that uh, people will, will look at is the eye. The eye is an incredible organ. It has a resolving power that exceeds uh, human design cameras for, with the same aperture size. Um, but all the parts need to exist or it will not function. So, you know, the light comes in the pupil there at the top of the picture in the upper right, uh, it goes through the lens. It goes through the transparent portion of the bulk of the eye and hits the retina, which is the light sensing portion. Uh, and then the signals go down the optic nerve to the brain. And, and something that's not included in that picture is the, all the image processing and information processing that occurs in the brain that, 
that uses that information that to determine like, uh, is that just grass waving in the wind out there or is there a lion approaching me? Um, so all that had to evolve, or well, all of it has to exist together in order for the organism to have any advantage whatsoever. You can't have just parts of the eye. Uh, another one is how, just how genes um, are expressed in cells. Uh, living things are made out of protein, which are made out of those amino acids he was talking about. But the instruction manual for, for making the organism is in the DNA. So somehow the information has to get out of the DNA into the machinery of the cell to, to build the protein. And uh, even the parts, the machinery in the cell that read the DNA, uh, that produce the messenger RNA that then goes out of the nucleus and then is translated in by ribosomes into the proteins, even those things are made out of proteins. So the instruction manual is read by the products that the instruction manual is, is telling it how to make. So it's really, all, again, all those parts have to function. Hard to imagine how uh, they, they could have evolved uh, together. Other examples include the blood clotting cascade, the immune system response, and the placenta. Uh, each of those is like a, a miracle unto itself. And they all point to an intelligent uh, creator um, as opposed to a, an evolutionary process. I just wanted to remind you before we jump into questions again to look at the resources online from Creation Ministries. Creation.com has lots of resources, including this one in the upper right, uh, the Creation Survival Guide, How to Graduate with Your Faith Intact. Every young person that heads to college uh, should, should read that book. Uh, it talks about how to um, survive in, in that environment uh, with wisdom, uh, how not to hide your uh, light under, under a basket, and at the same time, not go in with both barrels blazing and get shot down immediately. So it's definitely a good resource if you have children going away to college or in college. I highly recommend that. Uh, again, I highly recommend uh, you put on your bucket list going to see the Ark Encounter. So with that, are there any questions, any burning questions or comments? I enjoyed the comment last week about the La Brea tar pits. I went and did some research on it. And it was very interesting. So I've got a couple warm-up questions, if no one has a burning question. And they're, they're both, I think the, the answers are both related. But it has to do with um, who was Cain's wife? And why did people live so long back in the days of Genesis? Um, so in, again, I'm looking in uh, the New Answers book, which is an Answers in Genesis product here. I've also got a book called Genetic Entropy from Creation Ministries. Uh, again, they have great resources. Uh, well, in Genesis uh, chapter 5, verse 4, we read that um, Adam, after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years, and he had sons and daughters. So obviously, uh, Cain's wife was his most likely his sister, could have been a niece. And you know, many people immediately reject that conclusion that Adam and Eve's sons and daughters married each other by appealing to the law against brother-sister marriage uh, in Deuteronomy. Uh, some say that you can't marry a relation, and actually, if you don't marry a relation, you don't marry a human, because uh, we're all descended from Adam and Eve, so we're all related somehow. Uh, so we're all of one blood. Uh, the law forbidding close relatives uh, marrying was not given until the time of Moses in Leviticus 18 to 20. Um, so there was no disobedience to God's law originally. Uh, it turns out that our genetic material is degrading quite rapidly. And uh, back in the uh, early times, after, after the fall, uh, was pretty close to, to very recently created DNA, recently created genes. But we are losing about, let me grab this one here. There are 100 mutations per person per generation, 
and that's a very conservative estimate of the human mutation rate. So rather than evolving, we are devolving. And in here, there, there's this figure that indicates the fitness of the human race uh, is, as, as a, represented by the, the fitness of the DNA uh, information manual within us is degenerating at a 1% to 2% per generation due to the accumulation of mutations. And a 1% decline in fitness per generation is plotted here over a period of 300 generations, which is 6,000 to 9,000 years. Um, and this pattern is a classic biological decay curve. And the loss, this loss of fitness would clearly lead to a dramatic degeneration of the human race within that time frame, 6,000 to 9,000 years. In, in another figure, they plot the biblical lifespans uh, across generations after Noah. And again, we see a dramatic decline in life expectancy, and the pattern of decline, again, resembles a biological decay curve, fitting that same data that uh, was on the previous picture. Um, so people lived long times because their DNA was, had much fewer uh, mutations. And people could marry their sisters uh, without a fear of uh, having uh, mutations from the father and the mother both present in, in the offspring and thereby having a, a birth defect of some kind. So hopefully that answers that, and, and I'd point you to the references, and we can have a discussion if you want to learn more. Now, now for your questions. Who's got a question? And do we have a microphone, or I can go down to you? Any questions, comments? Well, Dr. Ellis actually texted me a question today about where did all that water go after the flood? And that, that's a pretty good question, right? If it covered the earth uh, and went above the highest mountains, uh, where'd it go? <laughs> um, there, there's a couple of, of different ways I like to look at it. Um, one is that if you took all the high mountains and scrunched them down, took all the ocean ba basins and lifted them up, um, there's enough water in the oceans to cover the entire Earth to a depth of about seven kilometers. So one possibility, of course, nobody was there. Nobody knows what really happened except for God himself. Um, so one possibility is that the mountains, the tall mountains and the deep ocean basins didn't form until the flood, uh, or until after the flood, and allowed the water to drain off. Um, an another possibility that's kind of implied in the Genesis creation story is that all the land was in one continent. Um, like even geologists believe at one time there was this Pangaea continent. And then all the continents broke up from that. If that occurred during the flood, and all these continents are moving to their, where they're currently located on the earth, there would be giant tsunamis that would be miles high and would certainly reach to the top of the highest mountains and deposit all those marine uh, creatures up there to be fossilized as well. So it could be more of a dynamic situation. The flood could be more dynamic with water moving all over the place at different parts of the earth, or it could be more, more static and just have been... Uh, closer to spherical than, than it is now. Also, after the flood, there would be a lot of surface covered with, still covered with water. If the water was draining off, there'd be a thin film of water left. Uh, the amount of water that's evaporated uh, is proportional to the surface area covered by water. So there'd be a lot of evaporation due to that. A lot of cloud formation. Clouds block sunlight. So then the temperature would go down and most creationists believe that after the flood, there was an ice age at that point in time. So a lot of it would have been come down as, as rain or snow and been frozen uh, as, as glaciers and snow covering as well. So hopefully that, that helps clear that up. Uh, did I see a question down there? Oh, sorry. I'll try not to steal your answers. That means you have to come up with another question. 
Oh, we got a question back there. From what I've seen, it would not. Um, very low-lying locations, like the state of Florida, most of that would be covered. Um, but yeah, there is not enough water given the, the depth of the oceans and the height of the mountains to cover everything now. I'm not an expert in that area, but uh, you know, a lot of us have seen the, the, uh, the global, I'll just say global warming propaganda and, and the, the images of, of what land would be covered during various stages of the melting. What? Uh, yeah, did everyone here address the issue of volcanoes and how they fit into the evolutionary theory? Yeah, as we learned last week, uh, geologists uh, believe that there, it took long times for geological features to form, the geological column, which is all the different layers of sedimentary rock that, that you see in the Grand, exposed in the Grand Canyon. Um, but they, they believe that that happens through very slow processes. Um, but like Mount St. Helens has shown that those can occur very quickly. Mount St. Helens deposited hundreds of feet of soil uh, within uh, 100 miles or so of the volcano, and still tens of, well, tens of inches, even hundreds of miles away. So very rapid accumulation of soil, very rapid when, when the uh, glacier on top of the volcano melted because of the heat and all, all that came down with the mud. It carved a canyon that is of 1 40th the size of the Grand Canyon in a single day. Does that answer your question? Excellent. Well, the, so you're asking if God... Well, of course, gravity holds all the various layers, draws them towards the center of the Earth. Um, I'm fairly confident, uh, based on soundings that they've, they've made that gone, have gone through the Earth, they, they set off explosives and then put very sensitive sound detectors along. And you can tell where things are liquid and where things are solid, because in a liquid, there are no, uh, there's only longitudinal waves and no, there's no shear in a liquid, so there's no transverse waves. So I'm pretty confident that there is liquid, uh, you can call it lava, but in the middle it's believed to be molten iron because that's the most densest, densest uh, constituent of the Earth, and that would also support the magnetic field that the Earth has. Uh, if you have a moving conductor like iron, like molten iron, and it's moving because the Earth is rotating, and it stays rotating because of its angular momentum, which is huge. Yeah, and it's that magnetic field, actually, that, that uh, keeps us relatively free of the cosmic radiation, at least of charged particles. He 
He, he very carefully designed the universe for us to survive, and that's extremely fine-tuned. If you look at uh, physical constants like uh, the speed of light, the strength of the electrostatic force, uh, the nuclear forces, et cetera, there, if, if any of them were, were slightly detuned from their current values, uh, atoms wouldn't exist, molecules wouldn't exist, we wouldn't exist. And not only that, but if you look at our solar system, when he created the Earth and he created the moon and he created the Earth at a certain tilt, uh, it's tipped relative to, to the plane at which it orbits the sun, which allows us to have seasons. The moon allows us to have tides, which really have a role in keeping the ocean clean. Um, all, all these things are ex extraordinarily well balanced. It, it really points to a, a, a creator that had to put this together just with us in mind. Yeah, I, I'm looking at Genesis, and, and a couple of things strike me. One is, is God creates light first before he created the heavenly bodies. And that's, that's interesting, because that will probably bear on the, on the speed of light issue that I have. But the other thing I, it mentions in verse 6, it says, God so that there be a firmament in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament that divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament, and it was so. And this was before land was made, because the next verse talks about land being made. And, and so I, I have in my mind, and, and I don't know how this is physically possible, but that you might have some waters above you, because it says in, a, in, in another verse, the next chapter, that a mist came up from the ground before it rained. So uh, there was no rain at that point. So before the flood, in my mind, what this verse tells me is that you have a body, potentially a body of water surrounding the earth, and a body of water underneath the earth, and then land appears. And because God said, let land appear. And, and so what I see with water is a radiation block. So that any organisms underneath that water shield would not have any uh, damage from cosmic rays like we have. And then if you actually plot the life of all the patriarchs before the flood, they're fairly constant. Then after the flood, there's actually an erroneous a curve that drops off. Uh, and, and so that's kind of interesting because I think because the flood came when all the water above was dropped down onto the earth and then we lost our radiation shield. That's why we don't live 900, 1,000 years anymore. Just a thought. Right. right. And, the, and the, the mathematics, at least, at least on the ages of the patriarchs, the mathematics, again, support that Iranian relationship. And, and that uh, same relationship... Uh, also supports the rate, the observed rate at which our, our genes are getting cut those copying errors, those mistakes in them. Um, I, I recommend that you take a look at this genetic entropy book because it does go through those kinds of, kinds of arguments. But as far as, you know, Genesis starts out with, you know, the spirit moved over the deep and the water and, and, and the water was divided by the firmament we don't know what the firmament is. Um, I've actually reviewed a number of papers for the Journal of Creation that, that has some pretty wild theories of describing what that means. Uh, some of them uh, include the fact that, uh, that there's additional dimensions to the firmament because of the, the, apparently the Hebrew word that is used means uh, like a piece of metal that's being pounded flat and stretched out. Um, so there, there's, there's a lot of question about what that means. Um, but, but yeah, it, it's an interesting observation, the waters above and the waters below. Uh, there, there's some creation scientists that think that the waters above were, were much larger than the waters below, and they became the rest of the universe, and they expanded at faster than the speed of light uh, and formed all, all the, the various stars and galaxies. Um, 
And, and because of that, we're, we would be in a big gravitational hole, basically. Uh, and, and that clocks run slower because of Einstein's general theory of relativity in a gravitational hole. So it's possible thousands of years could have passed on Earth and billions of years could have passed uh, in the heavens. I mean, just, it's just a, a theory. Uh, but there's all kinds of possible. None of us were there. Only God was there to observe it. So we're, we're just speculating. But thank you. That, that's an interesting point. Anybody else? Oh, lots of questions. Okay. So, what was your question? <laughs> okay. Just, just segueing off of the other comment. Yeah. Like I said, we weren't there, but there's all kinds of possibilities. Um. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, again, just going back to the very beginning of the Bible, it says God created light. And that was a, one of the things that struck me is that light was created before the heavenly bodies were created, the sun, the moon, and so on. So I think that's kind of interesting. Do you have any thoughts about that? Yeah, I, I think that God had to create the laws of physics before he actually created matter. Um, for example, when he created light, that's when Maxwell's equations, which describe light, Came, came into being, basically. And the electric and magnetic fields uh, were created at that point. Just my speculation. Any questions I can answer with any certainty? <laughs> yes, Reps. Um, this isn't actually a question. I just was, um, I, I'd heard an analogy few years ago that um, uh, was given in regards to DNA and the information that was that's in DNA and the analogy is this that if the DNA is a CD and it has information on it of varying nature um, part of that information is how to make the CD player. Right. And in order to be able to get that information, you have to have the player. And that sort of goes to that irreducible complexity and, you know, how do you get the information off if you don't have the mechanism to get it off of that CD? But that's what DNA is. That's just an analogy that I'd heard I thought was pretty good. That is good, yeah. Because there's RNA polymerase, which is a protein that transcribes DNA into RNA, mRNA, which can come out of the nucleus of the cell. And then rib, ribosomes, which are also made out of protein, that translate the mRNA into proteins. So like you were saying, you have the, the music that are the instructions on the CD that tell you how to read this CD, how to build the machine to read the CD. That, that's a very good analogy. I like that. Any others? Well, I thank you for your time. 
Uh, again, we'll, we'll not meet next week, but the week after and talk about dinosaurs. Like when you go to the Creation Museum, that is one of their main features is about the dinosaurs, and relationship to dragon stories and dinosaurs. And pretty fascinating. So if you haven't been to the Creation Museum, if you haven't been to the Ark, I uh, highly recommend it. That's your pretty close to the next bucket list you make as a, as a trip and a family. Far more important for your faith to go there than it is to go to some other places, um, like Florida or something. Or something. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Ladiano, and, and uh, let's uh, have a prayer again. If you have questions, write them down, put them on the, uh, the feed that's uh, put up uh, after we do our study. Um, but um, grateful to have Dr. Laudiana here to help answer those questions and kind of explain some of the stuff that's otherwise more difficult to understand from these uh, lectures. But they are good, very good. Um, and I know when we're past time, I'm just going to make this real quick. You know, I have simple answers for people because most people understand simple things. When they say about evolution, about dogs becoming cats, cats becoming dogs, whatever, I say, look, do it in the laboratory. If you can artificially do it, I'll listen to you. But if you can't artificially do it in the laboratory, it didn't happen naturally. And I don't care how many zeros you put after that year. It just didn't happen. That's, a, that's just something everybody gets. <laughs> All right, well, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to, to again, uh, look, look at your word from the standpoint of science. Because, Lord, we know that true science, of what can be observed and what can be replicated, uh, Lord, does not conflict with anything your word says. Uh, only those who put into uh, the minds and hearts of people these theories that uh, cannot be substantiated and are based on uh, things, Lord, that your word clearly teaches are, are not true. But, Lord, help us as uh, we deal with uh, those around us to uh, or deal with them in a loving and considerate way. Lord, we know that your word is powerful. Uh, it does not... Uh, Lord, require anything of us to accomplish what you have set it forth to do. You said a long time ago before science that you have sent forth your word and it will accomplish what you intended it to do. So may we be the bearers of your word, the seed, plant, uh, Lord, uh, as much of it as we can into the lives of others. Thank you, though, for those who can uh, do a defense of the gospel and of those things, Lord, that people need to hear. I ask you to dismiss us with your grace, your mercy. And use us as you see fit to bring glory and honor to your name. In Jesus' name I pray.